Hello, I'm Matt Galloway, and this is The Current Podcast. Jennifer Brady has lymphedema. It's a condition that causes fluid buildup and a painful swelling in her legs. It is so debilitating that the Halifax woman spends at least five hours a day inside an inflatable suit to manage her pain. They first calibrate, so they take a little while to blow up all of, or like a couple minutes to blow up all the way. That's Jennifer getting into and zipping up the lympha press, which covers her from her chest to her toes. So inside the pants, there's a series of sort of inflatable balloons. As they inflate, what they're doing is they're sort of massaging or pushing the fluid out of my legs. It reduces the amount of swelling that I get um, in the day. So I use the lympha press usually three times a day for an hour and a half to two hours each time that I get in it. The relief that Jennifer gets from the device is temporary. Surgery that could improve her quality of life isn't available in Nova Scotia. But after three years of fighting to get out of province care, she says she is close to giving up, not just on the fight, but on living with her condition. In June, Jennifer Brady, a 46-year-old mother of two, applied for medical assistance in dying. CBC Halifax reporter Angela McIver is here to tell us more about the story. Angela, good morning. Good morning, Matt. Before we get into the MAID application, just tell us a bit more about Jennifer Brady and the condition that she lives with. Yeah, so like you said, she's 46 years old. She's a single mother and her kids are 9 and 13. She's a dietitian and right now she's on medical leave from her job as a university professor. And Matt, this all started in May of 2019. That's when she had a radical hysterectomy to treat cervical cancer. Her lymph nodes had been removed in that surgery. And soon after, she had extreme swelling in her legs and was diagnosed with lymphedema. It's a fairly common condition. More than a million people have it in Canada. In many cases, it's caused by obesity, but she has what's called secondary lymphedema caused by cancer. So she has an increased risk of getting cellulitis, a skin infection, and blood infections, and she has been hospitalized several times with both of those conditions. And so we heard her talk about that device that she uses and heard her getting into this device. How is this disease impacting her life? Yeah, so on the scale, her case would be considered moderate to severe. And Matt, I just want to give you a sense. Um, I went to her house a couple of weeks ago and Mm -hmm. it was a hot afternoon. And, you know, she was wearing two layers of the highest grade compression socks. She wears compression garments 24 hours a day. And she took them off briefly to show her legs. And I could see immediately that her left leg was inflating before my eyes. Yeah. So she says, though, that it goes beyond just physical discomfort. I have to budget the time that I'm on my feet every day. Um, And the amount of time I can be on my feet essentially allows me just to get the basics done. Making dinner for my kids, trying to clean my house every once in a while, even just sort of tasks of daily living sort of thing. Uh, It it greatly impacts, yeah, my kids. That's probably one of the hardest parts is just watching my kids watch me have to go through this and the pain that it causes and my inability to do things and then the burden and responsibility that falls to them. So that's what she's living through today. Take us back to to when this fight with the province began. Yeah, so following her hysterectomy in 2019, she was referred to the lymphedema clinic in Halifax, and they did things like measure her legs and recommend different grades of compression socks. But she says there were no other treatments being offered in Nova Scotia. She found out that Quebec, Ontario and BC all have surgical programs. So she decided to apply for out-of-province coverage through the Medical Services Insurance or MSI program. Mm -hmm. And I'll let her explain what happened next. I was actually a good candidate for surgery because I'm, you know, relatively young and quite healthy. Definitely up until that point, I was a lot healthier then than I am now. However, COVID and the sort of backlogs that COVID caused in hospitals um, meant that the hospital admin decided that they weren't going to take any out-of-province residents. So I wasn't then at that point able to get surgery in Montreal. Regardless of that, though, once I got back from Montreal, MSI at that point told me that they wouldn't cover the cost of my travel to Montreal and they wouldn't cover surgery because what I actually had to send them was a Nova Scotia licensed specialist's referral. So she needed somebody in Nova Scotia to give her that referral to sign off on that. Why didn't she just get the referral? 
This is the crux of this whole case. There is not a single Nova Scotia physician who specializes in lymphedema. So no one could have written her that referral, it turns out. Mm. But both her application and appeal were rejected because she didn't meet that bar. And so when that happened, she just pressed on thinking, you know, she'd pay for surgery herself and fight to get reimbursed later. So in June of 2022, she went to Japan and got the surgery. She went to Japan? Yeah. So one of the surgeries she was advised to get by the surgeon in Montreal is a procedure called lymphovenous anastomosis or LVA surgery. And it's an emerging field, but Matt, it is on Nova Scotia's insured services list. And it's a surgery that's available here in Canada, in other provinces and other countries. Mm. So she looked into the States and it was going to cost 260000 US. And the cost in Japan was 60000 And so what she ended up doing is she remortgaged her house to pay for that. Yeah. And I asked the surgeon she consulted with in Montreal about why it's so hard to access here in Canada, COVID backlogs aside, because that was the issue at the time. Mm -hmm. This is Dr. Joshua Vorstenbosch. He's a plastic surgeon at Royal Victoria Hospital. It's primarily plastic surgeons who are performing these surgeries. There's only a handful of centers across the country who are offering lymphatic surgery. And from the colleagues I'm speaking to from across the country, it's a pretty similar situation. The wait lists are so long for patients within their own city or province or health network. It really is a challenge to offer these services to patients from provinces where it's not necessarily available. Perhaps, you know, this is something we could encourage or advocate our healthcare systems to or healthcare insurers to collaborate to find some sort of interprovincial agreement so that we can provide these patients with the care that they need from other provinces. So in the face of that, she goes to Japan, she pays $60,000, she remortgages her house, as you said. Did the province pay Jennifer Brady back for the surgery she ended up getting there? No. It said it. she was advised not to seek treatment without prior approval, so the claim was rejected. And she told me the whole process has been utterly demoralizing. Those are her words. And so... Applying for a medically assisted death, as you can imagine for anything, is is a really drastic step. As you said, she's young, she has two young children. What was it that led her to that decision? Yeah, so she told me, you know, after getting through cancer, she's been struggling with this condition that isn't getting any better. Her surgery in Japan did help one of her legs, but the other leg has gotten worse. And so she's been putting her energy into this fight with the province, and she says her mental health has taken a big hit. I'll add just a bit of warning here for listeners that the comments that we're about to hear are pretty raw and mention suicide. So I used to run religiously every day. I used to love cooking, standing at the stove and cooking for my kids or cooking for friends and family. I can't do that anymore. I love to garden. I've got a vegetable garden at the back, which is all weeds now because I can't be on my feet. Um, also, the time that I have to spend in my therapy machine means that a lot of the things I used to enjoy are essentially cut out of my life, including work. You know, I love my work. My work is a really huge part of who I am and what's important to me. Um, I would have considered myself as a pretty positive, happy person, a really resilient person as well. Um, But I, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not doing well mentally, I guess I would say. Um, And one of the added struggles is that my healthcare providers tried putting me on antidepressants, which I need to sort of get through the day, get get out of bed some days. Um, but I can't take antidepressants because antidepressants cause swelling. Um, so I essentially have untreated um, depression, you know, as it does for anybody, hugely impacts your day-to-day, your, yeah, your desire to live even. I mean, that's heartbreaking. If you listen to her and you hear her voice, all of the things that 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 she loves have been stripped out of her life. Yeah. Applying for MAID is a huge step. And you might imagine that people would ask, 
if um, by putting that application in, there is pressure on the government to come up with an alternative, to figure out a way such that she can live her life um, in, in some degree that, that, that gives her all the things that life is supposed to give you in terms of joy and, and, and just a sense of accomplishment, but also just not living with pain. What's your sense of that? Is, is this about apl- applying pressure to the government? Yeah, so I've had a few people ask me that question. And since I would really have no way of knowing what's going on in her, in her head, I got in touch with her again after our initial interview. And I asked, you know, if applying for MAID is her way of getting the government's attention. And here's what she said. Yeah, that it's a good question. I totally understand it. So it's hard to answer. Um, I want to say that, yeah, it was all that. But the truth is that it wasn't, you know, like I am. Uh, I don't really want that to be true, you know what I mean? And I'm usually an incredibly strong person, and this has absolutely broken me. So um, I was uh, in June so close to killing myself. I really, it was really scary. And uh, I think the only thing keeping me here was my kids. And, um, you know, at some point that's not enough when I can't even take care of them. So, Matt, you heard her there say how much she was struggling in June. That's when she applied for MAID and that she almost wishes this was a means of drawing attention to her case. But she says it's not. It sounds like she's, I mean, it's broken her. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. And so in doing this story, I actually learned that the emotional toll of this condition is not uncommon. I spoke to Dr. Anna Towers. She's the director of the lymphedema program at McGill University Health Center in Montreal. She's also a palliative care doctor. And when asked if she was surprised to hear a lymphedema patient would resort to asking for MAID, here's what she said. I'm not surprised at all that some people would be desperate enough to say that it's too hard for them to be living with this condition. We've done research on the psychosocial impact of cancer-related lymphedema. If you can imagine, their treatment is over, they're told they're in remission, and then they're told that they have this condition that is lifelong, that needs to be controlled with compression and the treatments that they need are mostly not covered by Medicare and it has an impact on their work. Um, The other thing they report is their frustration and anger at lack of recognition by the medical profession. Arguably, it's one of the uh, most misunderstood or unknown uh, conditions. What patients would like to see is this condition recognized as requiring care, just as any medical condition requires care. So if you compare it to diabetes, for example, which is another chronic condition, well, we have screening for it. We have blood tests, we diagnose it early, we start treatment early, uh, we educate people about what they need to do uh, in terms of lifestyle, and we support them throughout their life. And the result is we prevent complications. None of that exists with lymphedema. So, Matt, the the lack of expertise in the medical field is a huge challenge. And as I mentioned, Jennifer Brady couldn't get a referral because of that. Mm -hmm. But even before that stage, Dr. Towers said people don't get diagnosed early enough, and that makes the condition even worse. She said if just 1% of cancer care budgets went to rehabilitation for lymphedema, it would do a lot to support the well-being of patients like Jennifer Brady. Where does this application for MAID stand now? And and how likely is it that she would be approved for medical assistance in dying? So it's still very much in the initial stages. She does meet all of the criteria for medically assisted death, except for one, that the medical condition underlying her request is irremediable. And that's a big hurdle. As we've outlined, there are treatments available, just not in Nova Scotia. So her application hasn't moved forward for approval, but it did catch the attention of the MAID clinical lead for Nova Scotia, Dr. Gord Gubitz. He wrote a letter to the special advisor to the Minister of Health and Wellness. And uh, Jennifer Brady shared that letter with me. Mm. It reads in part, 
I have reviewed dozens of atypical maid requests, but I have never found myself in the position of writing a letter such as this. In my experience, people do not request maid unless their life circumstances have become so dire that it is the only option. To do so when one is only 46 years old, otherwise healthy, and has two children at home is almost unthinkable. And he said there are clear options for care that have been identified and should be explored by the Department of Health. And he writes, your office can make this happen. Because ultimately, again, this goes back to that fact that she couldn't get that referral, right? Yeah, that's right. That's what it comes down to. And for in... And the fact that she didn't get prior approval for that surgery in, in Japan. So whether or not this was her intention, and again, this is a question that, that you can imagine people asking. Somebody has, in fact, taken up her case. What's the Department of Health saying now? Has it responded to that letter? So I asked for a comment on the maid application specifically, Mm -hmm. and I did not receive a response, nothing back. We did uh, ask the minister directly yesterday about this case at Province House. She would not speak to it directly, citing privacy and the fact she doesn't know the details. But Matt, one thing that has quietly happened along the way here is the province amended the legislation in respect to out-of-province and out-of-country care. And in t- as of 2023, it now allows the discretion from the minister on the specialist referrals, like the one Jennifer was told she needed. So in some cases, a doctor outside of Nova Scotia could now refer a patient if the minister gives that special permission. However, Jennifer Brady has asked, and the legislation is not retroactive, so it doesn't apply to her. So how is she doing now? I mean, does she have, given what she's living through, and we heard that in her voice, are there other avenues that she has to to appeal? Yeah, so Jennifer did file a judicial review of the previous denials for coverage, and that started back in 2022. Final arguments were made in March of this year, but there's been no decision yet, and she's anxious to get that ruling because it will dictate the steps going forward, Um, especially because earlier this month she applied again for out-of-province surgery on her other leg that has gotten worse, and just yesterday she found out that she's been denied again. So it's really difficult to be in that space of trying to remain hopeful and keep fighting for the care that I need, but also not get so hopeful that every defeat or every frustration or barriers undoes you. So yes, the judicial review, if that size in my favor, that would be huge for me. It would mean that one, the fight that I've had hasn't been for nothing, and it would also pave a way forward for me to potentially get reimbursed. You know, that's important to me financially. Again, as a single parent, I just simply can't afford that kind of medical expense. But because I still need treatment, I still need further surgery, uh, hopefully as well, I'd be able to access further treatment. So Matt, she's not without hope, but keep in mind, even if the judge decides in her favor, he can't force the Department of Health to reverse its decision or reimburse her, only strongly advise one way or the other. So a lot still hangs in the balance for her. This is quite a story. Angela, thank you very much for telling it to us. You're welcome. Angela McIver is a CBC reporter. She's based in Halifax.